Welcome to a new podcast from the new Silk Roads project. Today we are discussing the interesting developments happening in the Arctic, an interesting area for the Belt and Road, but it is an international project with many interests. This podcast will dive into the environmental aspects of the Arctic Silk Road, another interest that must not be forgotten. Don't forget to check out our social media. We have an interesting Facebook group in which we discuss many different topics regarding the new Silk Road. You can also check out our Twitter or visit our website where we have more podcasts, an online library and much more. So I want to turn to the last question, um, that of the particular challenge that's emerging in the Arctic regions. These regions are going to come under environmental stress, environmental strain, regardless of what is happening, because the melting of the ice caps with global warming is going to have a global impact on water levels and is in itself going to change fundamentally the ecosystems of that entire area. So the development of the Arctic region completely predates the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, the Arctic Silk Road might be a good form of branding, but that Silk Road's already been moving for several decades. Oil from the Subarctic regions of Russia are being exported to Western Europe for several decades. There are policy statements by the European Union on further developing the Arctic routes that say all the good things about control, about taking care of everything else, in terminology that is almost exactly identical to that of China's Arctic White Paper. The only difference for Western observers is that China has said the one and the European Union has said the other. So basically, this isn't a BRI issue, it's a general issue. And as the ice packs melt, as the permafrost goes, the opportunity for exploitation is going to become a chance. This is already what the Russians have said. Um, they have the largest land area in this uh, region. Um, and they say, yeah, it, it's going to be an opportunity. To be honest, I can't see the current American administration standing back and saying, oh, we're going to take care of all sort of environmental legislation. They're demolishing it across the United States. I don't see why they're now going to take higher standards in Alaska. Um, so basically, the exploitation of these regions is going to go ahead, whether it's the BRI or not. So let's have a look at what that infrastructure involves. Already you've got oil going to Western Europe. And in addition to that, now you have the exploitation of the Yamal gas fields. The Yamal gas fields are on China's Belt and Road. Um, it's mostly Russia that's developing it. It's Russian firms, it's Russian capital. But uh, the Chinese uh, Silk Road Fund has um, put in some money into the development of Yamal 1. And so it's on China's Belt and Road. But you could just as easily put it on France's Belt and Road. Uh, France, Total, a holder in the Russian exploitation firm, and Total has also invested above that in the project itself. In fact, the amount of French money in Yamal 1 is about the same as China's money. So and more, even more money is put in by the Russians. It's not China's project is a shared international project. Yamal 1 is already in full production and there's plans, cost about $20 billion. These are huge investments. And there are plans for Yamal 2. And Yamal 2 will have Russia, Total, France, China, plus Japan and Korea. So basically, this, this is developing with or without China. China's taking a share in that. It's also wanting to develop uh, icebreakers to help um, get that liquefied natural gas out of the area. Um, but it's Japan that's suggesting building a hub in uh, warmer waters on the east side of Russia so that the icebreakers can offload their na uh, liquefied natural gas, which you probably all know has to be kept at a sort of 200 minus 230 degrees centigrade and then reloaded onto uh, other ships, uh, more traditional gas carriers. So those facilities are being developed not just by China, but by Russia and by other East Asian and European partners. 
The second thing we have to look at if we're looking at the Arctic is the trade route across um, from east to west or west to east. At the moment, um, you're getting some headline ships that are going through with relatively small cargoes. Um, and there is going to be a while before this really starts developing because the entrance to the east end of the Arctic um, is much narrower and shallower than it is in the west. So you can't have large container ships going through. And by reinforcing them heavily um, to break ice, they become very expensive. It'll be a while then before the northern trade route begins to run. When the smelting of the ice goes further, then you can expect that route to develop quite quickly at the expense of the southern route because it's substantially shorter to go from China to Western Europe by boat over the Arctic route than it is further south. But if the loads are smaller, the economics of that is going to be less immediately obvious. And then the final thing you're going to get is further development. Um, we'll look at that in a sec, but there are plans now for railways. The Russians have uh, issued their railway plans. And between now and 2023, there'll be approval, or otherwise, after assessment, of 1,800 kilometers of new railway in that Arctic region. Um, it could be that the current fall in oil prices might um, derail, if you'll excuse the term, derail that project. Um, but at the moment, it could be that in the next decade, we have a large amount of new railways going through pristine uh, permafrost areas, going through forested areas, where basically up till then, little habitation has occurred. So let's have a look briefly then at the environmental impacts. The first thing you're going to have is a higher population density. Round these ports, round these mines, round the mineral exploitations, you're going to get a growth of populations, a larger human foot footprint, and as that goes into all the ancillary services, um, it's going to mean just generally more environmental pressure on the region. Then you have to take into account the mineral uh, exploitation. Um, Going for natural gas has a less of an impact once you've got everything there than, for example, open plan mining. Um, if you look at how much of these mines gouge into uh, pristine areas of Australia, and you can just transplant that into the Arctic, then you can imagine what a massive impact that is going to have on traditional migration routes, um, on local ground pollution, um, etc. So. Yeah, it doesn't really bear thinking about. The shipping, I think, is going to be less of a problem. Um, there's always the danger of accidents um, and oil spillages, um, but I don't think that's going to be as much of a problem as the noise and the general pollution effect of shipping. Um, we don't know what the impact is because of noise in what is basically a very quiet ocean space and what that will do with the large whales and other mammals um, that live in the region. Not only that, but the recent um, sulfur deficient fuels that are going to be used actually turn out to produce much more black carbon spectacles. And if that goes on the ice, it's unseemly, but if it goes in large volumes, it will also stop um, the uh, Oh, sorry, accelerate the warming of the region. So it's going to be cutting through um, various intact habitats. And I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned too much is it's going into what is basically the unexamined archive of mankind 11,000 years ago. Buried under the ice is our or the footprint of our forefathers and four, four thousands, thousands of years back. Already we're discovering animal parts with um, actual animal matter intact. Um, it, imagine what that will do in the black market when that starts selling. But this will allow DNA research um, and allow a deeper understanding of how life on our Earth, our warmer Earth, actually developed. And I don't like to say this, in that DNA, in that permafrost rest also diseases and viruses which we've never discovered, which have lain dormant for thousands of years and in these post-corona or corona epidemic uh, days 
I don't have to say what that could actually cause. It's going to take a lot of international cooperation, international cooperation devoid of geopolitical suspicions and charges and everything else in order to really develop in a careful and responsible way uh, these very pristine, very challenging uh, new areas. So I want to stop there. Thank you very much.